Um, and so tonight we are presenting Busting Garden Myths. And so hopefully everyone's got audio and on your screen you're able to see the title slide with my picture on it and our University of Illinois Extension website address. I will be asking for questions at the end of the program so you can unmute your microphone and ask then if you've called in on a phone line. The ability to unmute your phone is star six or please feel free to go ahead and just post your questions into the chat box and we will get to them as we can. So with that, we're going to just go ahead and get started. So when it comes to garden myths, you know, it, when we think about the advancement of technology and where we've kind of ended up, you know, if it's printed, it must be true. If it's on the internet, it must be true. If it's on Facebook, it must be true. If it's in an email, if it's on Pinterest, somebody tells you there's got to be something to it, right? And that's what we want to think, and that's where we kind of always end up, and especially with the ability and the advent of technology and the ability to search on Google for information. There's so much out there, and then the question becomes, how do you filter through it, and how do you figure out what is reality and what is myth, what does work or what doesn't work, or what might you know actually harm your plants or harm your soils, et cetera? So as an extension educator, what I do and the information we give out within the University of Illinois Extension and extension services across the U.S. is we base our information and our recommendations on research from universities, from researchers that are looking at different you know, issues and problems and insect pests and how is it best to try to you know, control these things. And then we go through the research and then we turn around and say, hey, this is what we're going to tell you is the best practice. The idea is that these recommendations are for better plant care, better plant health, better for the environment. But we also need to keep in context and keep in mind that new research comes out things change so that the recommendation we might have given 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago may not be the same recommendation we give now. So I always tell people, make sure to kind of keep up to date. And it's never a bad thing to ask questions and to say, hey, is this still the best way to do something? So tonight what I'm going to do is kind of go through a couple of common ones that I've seen, you know, we've seen in magazines or seen on the internet, and just kind of go through and figure out, is it truth? Is it myth? Is it kind of true? And so hopefully you'll walk away with some new ideas or really kind of rethinking which maybe some of the things you already knew. And so hopefully it'll be a very interesting session. So the first one's on trees. Um, I'm a tree person. That is one of my main focuses. So the first couple of slides are going to be on trees. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, should you always amend the backfill soil when you're planting trees? Is that a myth or is that truth? And when it comes to planting trees, that's a myth. We don't want to amend the backfill. We actually want to use the native soil that is there. So whatever we dig up, that's what's going to go back into the hole. What happens is if we start amending that soil, if we start you know, putting in really good compost and all this other really good stuff, it creates a path of less resistance and those roots are going to grow in that a lot faster. So you might have some circling root issues and eventually girdling root issues. But the other thing is when you have such a differential between soil um, types between the amended soil, maybe natural soil, we have some issues with water movement between those two, so we can actually cause even further problems. So at the end of the day, if you are planting a tree, which is something I will always recommend, make sure to use that native backfill. Use that native soil that's available. Your trees will do better. They'll be better for it. It's easier for them to establish. So don't add a bunch of compost to that backfill. And of course, if we continue on, you know, we talk about tree care and we always wonder about mulching. And I always kind of joke I'm the mulch queen and I'm the, the queen of mulching trees properly. So I always, I always love seeing this is the best way to mulch a tree is by mounting the mulch up like a volcano so that the tree trunk looks like lava coming out of the center of it. And this is a huge, huge, huge myth. We never, ever, ever want to mound mulch up that far. Maybe your neighbor has had it done, but that doesn't mean it's a good thing. More is not better. We don't want to apply a bunch of excessive uh, mulch. And you can see in this top left picture, um, this was taken by Gary Watson from the Morton Arboretum. 
you can see that just giant pile of mulch. And this causes a lot of issues. The picture on the right kind of happens when you start piling them excessive soil or mulch and you get those roots that actually come up trying to alleviate being too deep within that soil and so when mulch is too deep what ends up happening is it allows excess moisture to be held along the trunk which can cause um, damage can cause rot issues and so also what happens is it allows easier access for little critters like voles and other little things to get up to that trunk very easily under protection and then feed on the bark and damage that cambium. And that cambium layer is important because that cambium layer develops your xylem in the phloem which allows water and nutrient movement up and down within your tree. So you never want to have that damaged. So if, and I sh will say this, you should always mulch your trees. And the best way to mulch your trees is two to four inches deep keep it out a couple of inches from the trunk so it doesn't lay directly on the trunk and go out as far as possible and people ask me how far should you go and I always say go out to the drip line and I promise you I've gotten some quite interesting looks and I tell people that the roots of the trees not only do they go out to the drip line but they actually go and extend out farther and a lot of our tree roots are in the top 12 to 18 inches of the soil and there's a lot of feeder roots there and mulch creates a lot of benefits it helps to moderate the soil temperatures it helps to um, kind of keep a moderation on, on soil moisture it helps you know to slow down evaporation um, it keeps roots cooler and it ends up breaking down and adds organic material because here's the other thing when you're using mulch make sure it's organic based mulches such as shredded hardwood or cypress don't avoid anything like a rock mulch so always try to mulch your trees and it's always been beneficial for them now of course the other component is when we plant trees and when we keep going and planting trees and I'm driving up and down the streets in various communities you know I always see trees that are planted and I see them staked and the question becomes should we always stake trees at planting and you'll get instructions or you'll see the tree staking kits at the store and it's that idea of yes you should stake every single tree that you put in the ground and I'm gonna tell you right now it's a myth there's only two situations in which I'm really going to work to stake your tree after it's planted. Trees that are in very windy locations that are susceptible to being wind thrown. So if you get wind that comes through and takes it and is going to be able to push that tree over, then yes, you're going to want to stake it. Because the idea is that staking is going to help stabilize the tree so that it doesn't move so much that the new roots that are forming and kind of creeping out into the soil aren't going to get damaged and torn if the root ball isn't heavy enough so this can also be you know if you look at container trees versus ball and burlap trees ball and burlap trees are much bigger they're heavier they have more weight to kind of sit them down whereas container trees are a much smaller root ball and might be more susceptible to being thrown if you do stake your tree make sure to remove those stakes about six months to a year later um, anything more than that isn't necessary uh, when I see stakes that have been on trees for two three years I'm sitting there kind of scratching my head wondering what's up and I want to get out of my car and take them off um, the other thing to remember when you're staking trees don't stake them too rigidly you want the tree to have natural flow and bend when the wind hits it it creates what's called reactionary wood which gives it strength and durability and so trees that are staked too tightly um, and very rigidly sometimes what happens is if you have a major windstorm come through we've seen them snap off above the staking material we've also seen trees that after the staking material is taken off just kind of flop over they haven't developed that reactionary wood to hold themselves upright so they end up having some other additional issues so if you stake make sure there's a good reason for it we don't always have to do that As you probably see, I'm kind of on a proper planting mode. Um, when digging holes for trees, make sure to dig a hole two to three times wider than the root ball and no deeper than the root ball. Myth, truth, this one is truth. 
I've gone back through and you see old um, garden books that talk about proper planting for trees and they've got a hole dug directly this, the, you know, the width of the root ball and they actually say, you know, dig deeper, stir that dirt up under the root ball, better for the roots to, to kind of establish back in. And we have enough research and we know, by, you know, with fact that if we dig a hole deeper than the tree's root ball, what ends up happening is when that dirt settles down, our tree is now planted too deeply. Trees planted too deeply is a really big issue for some trees. And a tree planted too deeply, you can kind of look at it. And once you start getting a trunk, you look at it, and you're like, that looks like a telephone pole going into the ground. A tree should now look like a telephone pole. It should kind of think, if you think of a child's drawing of a tree where it gets to the ground line and it flares out, we want that flare at ground line. Trees that are planted too deeply, what they do is they'll compensate and they'll pull those roots up towards the surface to try to get them to the level they want. But what we also end up is with girdling roots. And so we have stressed trees, we have them more susceptible to disease and insects. So the idea is that when you plant a tree two to three times wider than the root ball, no deeper, don't amend the backfill. And make sure also right plant, right place when you're choosing to plant a tree. So the idea is that we're creating a positive environment for tree establishment by providing the right, you know, the right situation with the right planting hole for these trees. So we're going to go from trees to tomatoes. And if you're like me, um, I'm a big fan of tomatoes. I'm a big fan of fresh tomatoes. Last, sp last year, I had 12 tomato plants, and I was making sauce and frozen iced tomatoes and dried tomatoes left, right, and center. Um, but as most of you are probably gardeners, maybe your new gardeners know that the tomatoes you buy in the store just aren't the same as what you can grow at home. And when you start looking for things, you know, people are always looking for the best tomato. You want the one that's sweet and red or juicy. You have certain preferences in your own tomato choices. And so you'll see recommendations that say, add sugar to the planting hole when planting tomatoes to make them sweeter. You're going, well, does this work? And this one is a myth. The sweetness of the tomato is actually predetermined by the variety. Adding sugar to the planting hole will not make it sweeter. And the issue becomes there are so many different varieties on the market. How do you even choose? And for me, it's been trial and error. You grow a couple different varieties every year. You go, yeah, I like this. Yes, I don't. Or maybe your neighbor has some. You try theirs. You ask them what variety. And it is a trial and error experience trying to find the right ones. If you're looking for a really great um, Cherry tomato variety that's really sweet, uh, really juicy and amazing. Look for sun gold. I have friends that their kids will not eat a tomato if you look at them, no matter what they do. But if they give their kids a sun gold cherry tomato, those kids pop them like candy. They're very sweet. They're really juicy, and they're an amazing variety. But it does take trial and experience and just you know experimentation to find the varieties that work right for you. But adding sugar will not make a difference overall in your tomatoes. The next one is, can I place crushed eggshells in the bottom of the planting hole to prevent blossom end rot? For those of you who have grown tomatoes or maybe are new to it, blossom end rot is when you look at a tomato and you go to harvest it and you look at the underside and it's blackened, it's sunken, it looks like it's rotting. Blossom end rot is caused by a couple different factors. So can I find ways to alleviate that potential. And I've personally had that happen, probably many of you have as well. And there are options. And actually placing crushed eggshells into the bottom of a planting hole is actually mostly true. One of the big reasons we see blossom end rot in tomatoes for home gardeners, commercial gardeners, etc., is inadequate moisture. What happens is the moisture content just kind of keeps shifting. It goes up and down and it's not consistent and it ends up help minimizing the ability for calcium to be absorbed by the plant. So it's a lack of calcium um, associated with inadequate moisture or consistent moisture for tomatoes that actually causes blossom end rot. So the idea is that those crushed eggshells plus some extra moisture 
hopefully will alleviate any blossom end rot issues you may have had in the past or maybe you've been experiencing. So hopefully this is something you can use um, as something to help alleviate those problems. But yes, you can add crushed eggshells to the bottom to help alleviate some of the blossom end rot issues. I remember the first time I heard this one was, um, you know, probably 15 years ago. People were like, plant yellow tomatoes, they're less acidic, they're really great, you know, if, you're, if your stomach can't really handle red varieties um, and you like tomatoes and maybe it causes upset stomachs. And that yellow and pink varieties of tomatoes are less acidic. And sadly, just like adding sugar to the planting hole, this is also a myth. The acidity of the tomato is directly associated with the variety and the sugar content. So maybe what might have happened is you had a yellow variety that just had a higher sugar content, and maybe that's what ended up happening. But overall, what ends up happening is we look at the variety, we look at the sugar content. You might have red varieties of tomatoes that are actually less acidic. So there's variations. So just because it's red or yellow or pink does not mean that the acidity of that tomato has been lessened enough. So you might kind of want to look, do some research, talk with people. Um, but again, there's so many hundreds of varieties out there, it's kind of hard to keep tabs on all of them. and peonies. So now we're into the flower side of things. Um, the picture you're seeing in the screen, this is actually from a peony blossom in my own yard. Um, and I always love when things pop in my yard so I can take great example pictures of what's going on or when I'm kind of walking through my community. And in this picture, it's kind of hard to see, but on the right side of that, that uh, kind of that right bottom side of that blossom is kind of looks like some black specks and those are ants. And in this one, we're talking about our ants integral to helping peony blossoms open. And this one is a myth. And I remember, again, I remember years ago hearing that ants are integral to peony blossoms opening. They help them pop open. I went, well, that seems kind of, you know, that would make sense. They're covered in ants all the time. And, you know, research shows, as always, that Ants do not help peony blossoms open. What ants are there for is their sugary secretions that are being exuded by those buds, and they attract ants, and the ants are just feeding off them. The ants do not create any beneficial situations for the plant, nor do they cause any negative situations. Um, a lot of people just view it kind of negative that their peonies are covered in ants um, at the time. So sometimes you'll see a lot of peonies kind of situated off away from the house because people just don't. They just don't feel comfortable with ants that close. Um, but they are looking for the sugar that is there, and they do not help the flower to open. But again, it's one of those things that has been perpetuated as a myth throughout the gardening community. And as gardeners, we all know the importance of watering. And it's one of those things that never is an ending chore. So the question then becomes, is watering in the middle of the day going to cause leaf scorch since light is intensified by the water drops on the leaves? And then you stop to think, and you kind of think through this, and then you think about the fact that what happens when it rains in the middle of summer? If this were true, think about the amount of leaf damage we'd see on plants in the middle of summer after a, you know, afternoon rain and then the sun comes out and starts shining, what would happen? So what we see is that this is not the case, but what we do recommend is watering earlier in the day. So if you are doing manual watering, do it early in the morning or earlier in the day because what it does is it allows those leaf surfaces to dry off before it gets dark and cooler and helps to minimize foliar disease issues that might happen when you have a wet leaf situation going into cooler temperatures at night. So, you know, for me as an example, um, I work during the day, so I come home and then I'm pulling out the hose at like five o'clock at night and I'm watering my plants. If it's one of those situations, you know, if you're watering a vegetable garden and you're hand watering tomatoes, try to water from the bottom. Minimize that water from hitting the leaves. So there are options, but the idea is that you can water in the afternoon, 
water hits the leaves, it's not going to cause damage. But I have seen that as a myth that's kind of perpetuated out there that don't water during the day, it'll cause leaf damage. And that is definitely not the case, something we are not going to worry about. For years, um, I didn't have a yard in which I could dig up, so I did a lot of container gardening. And now that even though I have a yard, I still do a lot of container gardening because I have pockets that maybe aren't quite suitable to being dug up, or I just end up with a bunch of extra plants and I need something to do with them. And so I end up doing a lot of container gardening. And I'm a big proponent of it because container gardening is a great option for those that maybe don't quite have the space for a full garden. Um, maybe they want to grow certain things, but the area they can dig up isn't quite suitable for a certain plant. So containers are a great option and alternative. And one of the things we always, you know, have seen is should you add add gravel to the bottom of the pot to assist in drainage or to help plug holes, it'll create benefits. And lucky us, we have soil scientists that have done research into the realm of what you should or should not do in containers. And actually, we don't recommend putting gravel in the bottom of containers because what ends up happening is that when you go from a finer texture medium to a coarser texture medium, the finer texture has to become saturated before it will drain. So what ends up happening is if you're not getting drainage out the bottom, you could very likely be oversaturating your actual potting mix within your container. And I've had a lot of people ask me, well, what do you do about those giant containers? I don't want to fill them with potting mix because that's really expensive. What do I do? And can I use packing peanuts? Nope, same issue. Finer texture, coarser texture. So what I recommend to people that if you have a very large pot and you don't want to have to fill the entire thing, what you can do is set a you know, pot upside down in the bottom and then put a smaller pot on top of that to help elevate and then use that as a way to kind of fill that pot without filling it completely. Um, and it's a way to offset because we all know how expensive potting mix can get, especially in really large containers. People have also said, well, what do I do? Because I want to prevent that dirt from flowing out the bottom of the drainage holes because your container should always have drainage holes in the bottom of them. What do I do? Well, what I've, what I've done and I've had great success with is put in the bottom of the pot, put a piece of newspaper that's cut to fit, just a single sheet, doesn't need to be a whole stack of them, or even a coffee filter. I use coffee filters. I have extra coffee filters sitting in my house specifically for the purposes of putting in containers. And what's great about them is at the end of the season, when you go to dump the pot into your compost, instead of having all those rocks you have to pick out, now you have completely degradable material that's in there that's probably already degraded that you won't even see at the end of the season. So instead of resorting to rocks or pebbles or anything else, besides the fact that it inhibits drainage, this way you're not having to deal with it getting into your compost pile as well. Um, somebody just, so we're not jumping ahead, somebody just asked how, how can we avoid filling up a large pot with potting soil. And it's the idea of putting a smaller pot inside of a larger pot. And what I'll do is I'll flip a pot upside down in the bottom of the larger pot and then put the, the next pot on top of it, kind of do a stacked situation. And so I'm only going to fill that smaller pot that's inside the big one um, so that you're not going to have that big fill issue. Because you get some really neat looking large pots. They're just really expensive if you wanted to fully fill them. And of course, we can't forget our turf. So um, I worked for a couple of years at a golf course as a head horticulturist, and I got the option and ability to help with some of the maintenance on the golf course um, and see what went into it. And so, you know, sometimes you'll see people that talk about, I love golf and I want a putting green in my backyard. And my response to that is, trust me on this, it's way too much work. You don't want to do that. Um, the inputs that go into golf course maintenance are much higher than even lawn care at a homeowner level. The type of turf, the insect management, the chemicals in regards to disease management, 
that are used to keep those golf courses looking like they do is beyond what we as homeowners um, are going to want to involve ourselves in. And trying to maintain our own home turf is already hard enough. Let's not add on to that. Now, when it comes to turf, you know, we, we like that green lush lawn. Everybody, you know, they like that idea of having that green front lawn. Maybe some of you listened to uh, Chris Unruh's sustainable um, garden thing about, you know, turf care and lawn care and, and some of those concepts. Um, but if not, um, one of the things we talk about is, you know, what do you do for proper turf care? And we see it available in lawn care company offerings as well as, you know, garden centers and box stores selling, hey, here's your turf care products. Should you apply turf fertilizer early in the spring to encourage new growth? I'll be the first to tell you don't do it. What ends up happening when we do early spring fertilization is it pushes a bunch of green leafy growth at the expense of needed root growth. Majority of the turf grasses in Illinois are cool season grasses. Kentucky bluegrasses are one of our majority components. These are cool season grasses. They like the cooler seasons of spring and fall. And then during the summer, they go dormant. But what ends up happening is if we push a bunch of fertilizer and a bunch of top growth, we're reducing root growth expansion that can cause stress and strain on the turf during the summer and actually cause them to maybe kind of fade out. Maybe they're not going to be as hardy. They're not going to come back as well. So what we recommend actually is wait till you're the middle of May. So right about now and only if you plan to irrigate all summer. And that's one of the big ones is push the turf if you're going to irrigate. If you start irrigation during the summer when a lot of our spring rains have backed off, don't just start and then kind of forget, see your lawn is turning brown, start again, it goes brown, you start again. What ends up happening is you're stressing the turf out and you're using a lot of valuable resources. And that's going to reduce that survivability and the success rate of your turf grass. So your best bet is to just, you know, either start irrigation and continue or just let it go dormant and it'll come back and green back up in the fall. Asparagus patches. And if you've ever grown asparagus, you know it's a perennial crop. And one of the big competition issues that we have with asparagus is that you have to deal with the weeds. How do you keep the weeds out? And if you look through old older gardening books, it'll talk about using salt to control weeds in an asparagus patch. The idea is burn the weeds out, then you're not going to have competition. Sadly, adding salt to the soil to try to control weeds ends up adding excessive salts. Excessive salts in the soil can cause root burn, can cause plant stress and strain and plant damage, and can eventually cause soil damage. So, you know, a lot of manual labor usually is end up being required to kind of get that, that weeds out of your asparagus patch and hopefully that you're not going to fight them because asparagus patches, because of the way those root systems form, you really want to have minimal disturbances within those root systems so that you have a solid asparagus patch. So my recommendation is do not use salt to try to control weeds in your asparagus patch. And of course, we're always trying to find better ways to control weeds. People say, what can I do instead of traditional herbicides? Can I use vinegar? Can it be used effectively at controlling weeds? And for the most part, using vinegar to control weeds is mostly myth. What ends up happening is the, acid the acidity level within the vinegar, the acetic acid, is not consistent between batches. The level that is needed to actually cause severe damage in plant death is, usually, is higher than you're going to find in a store. And majority of the store-bought vinegars, what ends up happening is it damages and kills off that top portion of the plant, but it's not systemic. Systemic means that it's going to travel throughout the entire plant, and it's going to kill off the top portion as well as the root system. That's what Roundup does. Roundup glyphosate is a systemic herbicide and will um, cause you know plant decline and death compared to 
um, some of the others. Vinegar will kill the top portion, so what will happen is we'll see people apply vinegar, it looks like plants are dead, and then they go back and they start seeing that the plants start to regrow because the root system is still intact and allows it to actually come back. So when it comes down to it, trying to control um, weeds with vinegar, we're, we're seeing is not effective enough, it's not consistent enough to be able to provide the control that most homeowners want. Cut flowers. Um, this is a picture from my yard from last year. I just, it was one of those things I went rummaging around my yard, was having a great time collecting just various flowers because um, they're just, it's its so amazing to be able to have just so many options. And of course, if we have cut flowers, we always want to make sure that they last long. The longer they last, the happier we are. And so what can we do? And you'll, you know, can you add an aspirin or a penny to cut flower water to extend the life of the flowers? And sadly, it is a myth. It'd be great if there was an easy solution. But only materials that are directly designed for extending the life of flowers will actually work. One of the other things that you can do, too, is if you're collecting cut flowers from your garden, either as soon as you cut them, put them directly into water, or if you cut them and then bring them inside, before you put them into the vase, recut the base, because what ends up happening is, after you cut the flower, it's going to try to seal off to minimize moisture, and it's going to create a seal that's going to start, is going to inhibit water uptake. The other thing I'll recommend is instead of cutting the stems flat, cut them at an angle. So if they do hit the bottom of the vase, they're going to be at an angle, and there's still going to be water uptake. If they're flat and they hit the bottom, now you've kind of created a suction issue. So there's a couple of other options that we can do um, besides using, you know, materials ex that extend the life of flowers, but we can also do a few other things um, to kind of help encourage um, further plant growth or that the sustainability of our cut flowers once we bring them inside. So not only is we control an issue, we're always wondering what we can do about our wonderful insect pests that we always seem to be fighting, and one of them is Japanese beetles. How do you con can you control grubs in your lawn this year to guarantee that you won't have Japanese beetles next year? And knowing the damage that Japanese beetles have done and what the damage I've seen them do, I wish it were true. <laughs> Sadly, controlling grubs in your own lawn is sadly a myth. It does not eliminate the Japanese beetles that will show up in your own yard. Japanese beetles are able to fly 10 to 15 miles, and what they do is they release an aggregation pheromone, and it's basically a summoning chemical that tells other Japanese beetles, hey, I found a great food source. Come find me and come join me. So that's why you'll see linden trees that are just, instead of being green in the middle of summer, they're just this brown lace work because every bit of green is gone because the Japanese beetles have had a giant feast um, upon the poor linden. So just because you control grubs in your own lawn does not inhibit the Japanese beetles. Um, it might help to alleviate maybe if you're having issues with grubs in your own yard, you know, they're causing damage because grubs do feed on the root systems of turf. So if you are having grub issues, that might be one thing. But also remember that Japanese beetles come back to your yard, at, you know, and they're going to relay eggs. You're gonna, it's going to be something that's going to be kind of a cycle. So... Just because you control them and grubs in your yard does not going to eliminate next year's issues. And so people are always trying to figure out, what do I do about the adults that show up in my yard of Japanese beetles? Um, in this picture is a Japanese beetle that's actually just hanging out and chilling on a basil leaf. Um, and this was in my yard from... I want to say two years ago, and I was sitting there going, what are you doing on basil? I didn't think you enjoyed it, but apparently they were they were happy to, to munch upon whatever they could find at the time. Um, and so people say, can I use traps? You go to the stores, you see the Japanese beetle traps, and I'll talk to people and they say, yeah, I get those Japanese beetle traps. I fill them, and I dump them, and I fill them again, and I keep dumping them. Here's the catch. Japanese beetle traps are based on the same aggregation pheromone concept that the bugs themselves it, it, it actually give off. 
So what we're doing is we're putting these Japanese beetle traps in our yard that have the same concept of pheromones. What ends up happening is you get yours and your neighbors and your neighbors' neighbors and every Japanese beetle starts showing up. And so, yeah, you're dumping those traps constantly, but you're really never reducing the Japanese beetle population because all you're doing is encouraging more of them to show up. And if there's a food source, they're also going to hit the food source. So what I recommend is to avoid using Japanese beetle traps. They're really not beneficial. They are not going to create a reduction in the population. And so people will ask, well, what do I do? Um, and so, you know, looking at chemical control options is one thing, especially if you have plants that are susceptible to Japanese beetle damage. You know, looking into what are systemic chemical or insecticide options to help minimize that damage. Um, I also tell people if you're having one of those days and you're really frustrated and you've got Japanese beetles, take a bucket of soapy water and just knock those things right in there and, you know, and have that as a way to get some frustration out. Um, but yeah, just try to avoid those Japanese beetle traps. They're really not going to do you any good at the end of the day. So I'm going to have you, I'm going to ask you a quick question on this one. And this one in the picture in the left, core, top corner, I'm kind of curious just for my own, you know, own interest. Does anybody recognize what the insect in this picture is? If you do, go ahead and post a comment in the chat box. I'll just give it a few minutes or a few moments to see if anybody recognizes it. Or if you're calling in on a phone, go ahead to feel free to unmute your phone and, you know, say what you think that might be. But this one's always fun just kind of as a hort trivia. Okay, we've got a couple. We've got squash vine borer, box elderbug, box elderbug. Just give it a quick moment. It looks like there's about 40 of you online. We'll just give you a few more moments. If you're calling in on a cell phone, star six will unmute your line. Um, if you didn't have it muted, we have gone through and muted you. So, um, But feel free to unmute yourself and kind of call out your answer. This one kind of throws some a few people for a little bit of a loop. They're not used to seeing it. Um, and it's again, it's those photo opportunities when you find them. And for those of you who answered squash fine borer, this is a squash fine borer adult. Um, that is one of my squash plants in the picture. And so I know when I see this guy, I need to start monitoring for squash vine borers. Um, and squash vine borers are the ones where you start looking at your squash plants and they're starting to wilt. You know there's adequate soil moisture and you're trying to figure out what's going on. And you look towards the base of the plant, the ground line, and you start seeing this frass, of what looks like almost like sawdust. And you realize there's a hole at the base of the plant. And then you start digging up and you find there's a little borer that's feeding through. And this is the adult version of it. So this is squash vine borer. But when it comes to pest control, you know, people think, you know, the thing is, are organic chemicals completely safe to use when compared with synthetic chemical options for pest control or herbicides or, you know, fungicides, etc.? And the answer is, no, just because they're organic does not mean they're safer. There are some organic pesticides that sometimes can be even more toxic than some of our synthetically derived chemicals uh, for pest control. What it comes down to at the end of the day, make sure to read the label. Follow the directions. Follow what it says. Double check what it uses, you know, what it is for control what you can use it on. Does it give directions for safety gear? Does it say how warm the day should be or should not be? What about winds, etc.? Always be safe. The other thing I'll recommend is that labels change. So even if you bought the same chemical three years ago and read the label, labels change. So reread. Make sure that it's still 
the same. Um, just to refresh your memory. Um, it's one of those things I tell people, be careful when you go out there, you know, don't spray in shorts, you know, make sure you have safety goggles on, make sure you wear gloves, be smart. Whether or not it's organic, it's still a chemical with a specific goal in mind of harming an insect, taking care of a fungus, destroying a weed. Just be smart and be safe and monitor your own health. So don't make the assumption because it's organic that it's completely safe. It's still a chemical product designed to do a specific task. So always just be a little bit careful and smart in regards to what you're doing. As with plant care, you know, we look to plants as a sign for are there needs, are there problems, what's going on. We tell people monitor your plants to know what they need. And when it comes to watering, watering is definitely one of them. And usually a reaction when we see a plant, a plant's wilting, it needs water, get out there with the watering can, pull the hose out, and get water on that plant, let's stop it from wilting. And a lot of times that might be the case, but here's the thing. Plants that don't have, a, that have too much moisture can exhibit signs of those that don't have enough. They will cause wilting issues. So it's the same issue. So what ends up happening is we need to make sure we're monitoring the soil moisture as well. So if we see a plant wilting, before you assume to automatically pull out the hose or pull out the watering can, check the soil. Put your finger down in the soil. Is it dry? About, you know, half inch to an inch down? If it's dry, go ahead and give it, give it water. But if you get your finger down a half inch and it's still soaking wet, now we need to look a bit further. Now we need to see if there's something else going on. And what ends up happening is if the soil holds too much moisture, we can end up getting into some root rot issues that can cause plant decline. So the idea is also oversaturated soils, unless your plant is adapted to waterlogged soils, actually suffocates the roots. Roots actually need some level of oxygen. So if we've got too much water in there or moisture within the soil, we're actually kind of suffocating our roots out. So before you jump to the conclusion that your plants need water, always check first just to make sure and just to be safe. And a lot of times we're always looking for plants that might be a little bit easier to care for. Ones that maybe don't require as many inputs. You know, we I always love the one that people are like, I want a no maintenance landscape. And if you've ever managed and worked with plants, you've had a small amount of plants in your garden, you know that just doesn't work. Um, so, but we're always trying to figure out things that are maybe a little bit less environmental impact, a little bit less in regards to the amount of water or maintenance. And so, you know, we looked at maybe drought tolerant plants and do drought tolerant plants not need water? Okay, there we go. Uh, drought tolerant plants don't need water is a myth. Drought tolerant plants still need adequate moisture after planting to assure establishment. So you can't just put a drought tolerant plant in the ground and then forget to water it and, expe and expect it to do okay. Drought tolerant plants still need to be watered. So whatever tactics you would do for establishing any of your rest of your perennials, same thing is going to go for your drought tolerant plants. They do still over time need water to survive, but what ends up happening is they can go a longer time in between uh, moisture events than some of our other plants and still be okay. It means that when there's a longer extended period of drought or lack of water, they're under less stress, they survive better, they're not as susceptible to insect and disease issues. Um, whereas plants that need moist, well-drained soils, those are the ones that when they start getting really dry and it's been too long, they start getting stressed out and they're more susceptible to attack. So just remember that even though they're drought tolerant, they can still be susceptible to damage on, through establishment. Of course, perennials. Um, this is a switchgrass. This is an ornamental switchgrass in this picture and it's one of my faves. It's just a great upright plant, absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it's a perennial, 
um, love ornamental perennial grasses, used to not be a huge fan of them, and then discovered that they're just amazing plants to add structure and integrity to your gardens. Um, but as a perennial, you know, when can I divide them? When is the best time? And can you divide perennials any time of the year? Yes, you can. You can divide perennials any time of the year as long as you are providing them with adequate moisture and adequate aftercare once you've dug them, divided them, and then planted them. Of course, the best time is going to be either spring or fall, cooler temperatures, a little bit more moisture availability, a little bit less stress. Um, but I have done my fair share of helping to dig plants in the middle of summer in June or July, taking them home and then put them in the ground. And then I just make sure to provide adequate moisture and have success rate at establishment. So it can happen. Um, again, it comes down to just making sure you can provide them the moisture that they need to be able to survive and aren't going to be stressed out. But you can divide perennials any time of the year without problems. And as a gardener, we all have our supply of equipment. And one of the things we tell people is with equipment, you know, especially if you're having disease issues, is to sanitize. So, for example, if you have an ornamental pear and it's having issues with fire blight, and we tell people cut, you know, eight inches below the last sign of fire blight, make sure to sanitize your equipment, your pruners or saws in between each cut to help minimize the chance of moving that, 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 that problem to the next part when you make another cut. And so what is the best sanitizing and sanitation options we have for our equipment? So is a 10% bleach solution a great way to sanitize pruning equipment? And I used to work, the golf course I used to work at, that's what we did. We used a 10% bleach solution to clean equipment, to clean containers, and to try to help minimize disease exposure um, if we were concerned. And what we've discovered is that Using a 10% bleach solution on metal equipment like pruners or saws can actually cause pitting in the metal. And so we don't want to use a 10% bleach solution. Now, I'll use it on, you know, containers like plastic containers. I've done that. But when it comes to metal, it can pit that equipment. And if you put, you know, good money into good equipment, you want to let it, you know, you want that to last as long as possible. So if you're trying to find something that will allow you to help sanitize that material, um, the best way is to use something that's got antibacterial properties, antiseptic mouthwashes, um, antibacterial cleaners, and then just make sure to really wash them off afterwards, and it's going to be a great way to sanitize without causing metal pitting on your equipment. Companion plantings. If you're somebody that likes to go on Pinterest, and if you've ever kind of searched around in the in the gardening world, you see these amazing, great graphical charts of plant this with this this plant to prevent this disease issue and this insect issue, and there are these great graphical images, and they're really kind of neat. Um, you really want to print them out, and you want to put them in a poster frame, and put them on your wall. And so the idea is that planting specific pests, such as marigolds, can reduce insect pests. Do we have research to back this up? And sadly, the answer is no. And sadly, it's mostly myth. A lot of those companion planting charts that we see on the internet, in Pinterest, Facebook, etc., don't have scientific backing to show that they work. The bit of science we do have in regards to companion planting is that specifically the variety of African marigolds when planted in specific soils will help have control over certain nematodes. But the idea that marigolds will have good control over a variety of insect pests is sadly not scientifically proven. We do not have enough scientific evidence to show that companion planting is beneficial. And so uh, people say, well, what do you think? Well, I don't have the research to back it up. You can try what you wish. You can do what you wish. But I don't have the science to show that the companion planting charts that are out there are actually realistic and actually work. Um, so again, certain you know African marigolds in certain soils control certain nematodes, but the idea that they have a lot of um, insect control you know insect control properties we just are not aware of right now. 
Reducing irrigation in fall. So should you reduce irrigation in the fall to assist with winter dormancy? And the answer is no. Reducing winter irrigation can actually result in drought stress and actually reduce the ability for the plant to survive the winter. What we want to do is as long as the ground's not frozen, roots can pull stuff up. And especially for plants such as, you know, that are evergreen, such as boxwoods or rhododendrons that are going to hold their leaves through the winter, what ends up happening is they are, they're going to still be pulling moisture as long as the ground's not frozen. And so we want to make sure that there's adequate moisture available for them. But in general, trees, shrubs, plants, make sure there's adequate moisture as long as the ground's not frozen, especially for, you know, our, our woody ornamentals is really beneficial. It helps to minimize that drought stress and strain, and they have better survivability through the winter. So don't assume that reducing irrigation in the fall is going to actually trigger any kind of beneficial dormancy or increase hardiness of your plants. And kind of we've come for, you know, we've kind of come full circle. We're back to some vegetables and, you know, people are saying, well, what can I do? I don't have a lot of sun. I don't have much sun. You know, can, can you only grow vegetables if you have a full sun location? And my response is, yes, you can grow vegetables if you don't have a full sun location. There are a lot of vegetables that can be grown in less than full sun. Things like beets, beans, uh, peas, radishes, turnips, they can all survive within about the four to six hour range. Now plants like tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, they really need that eight plus hours. They need that really intense, you know, higher level of sunlight through the day to have their best level of production. But you can also grow a lot of our leafy greens, Swiss chard, kale, spinach, lettuce, cabbages. They don't need that intense amount of sunlight such as our tomatoes. So you can get away with a two to four hour span of sunlight and be able to grow a lot of leafy greens. So even if you don't feel like you have the space, there are always options to kind of incorporate vegetables, especially the concepts of, you know, edible landscapes and edible gardens and how do I incorporate these plants that I can eat along with my flowers and things that are, you know, ornamental in nature. So never feel limited by what you have. There are always some options there that we can work with. Compost tea. Compost tea is great for adding beneficial bacteria and fungi to your soil. The idea is you take compost and you kind of saturate it with water and that water sits with the compost and then you filter it off and then you water your garden with it. And my response to compost teas is a big giant, please don't do it. Um, some compost tea recipes also say, hey, add sugar to the mix because it'll increase the benefits of bacteria and fungi to your soil and what ends up happening in these compost teas in which we add sugar it can encourage E. coli formation and then we apply it to our garden and now we have a health risk issue so we do not want to apply compost teas they're really they're they don't provide the bacteria and fungi benefits it does not improve soil quality like compost does so my recommendation is skip the tea add the compost your soil will love you for it. Um, there's just too much risk, health risk issues with compost teas and the benefits that real good compost provides that tea doesn't. Um, and it, again, it sounds great, but it's not providing the benefits. So skip the tea, add the compost. You're going to have a healthier garden, healthier soil, better plants. And some of you might be kind of wondering, well, what can I do? Because I've got horrible clay soil. In a horrible clay soil that when I go out there, I can sit there and sculpt something with it. I've planted trees in the middle of rain and heavy clay soils, and you, you know, walk away and you're just covered in, you know, clay soil, and you're just from, you know, knees down, and you're going, what do I do about the soil? What can I do? So can I add sand? Sand sounds like a great idea. You know, you think about water that you pour into sand and it kind of gets in there and then drains down and out. So if I add sand to heavy clay soil, I'll improve quality and drainage. The one issue we have is the ratio of sand you would have to add to clay is about 50% of the total soil volume to see any level of change in regards to quality of soil and drainage. That is not a feasible 
option. Um, especially, you know, when you think about the, the amount of soil, you know, amount of sand you'd have to bring in and try to incorporate and get it down, incorporate into, you know, you know, down into the soil, it becomes really problematic. And so you can't just go, well, I have this little itty bitty spot. I'm just going to add a bunch of sand into it or a little bit of sand into it and make it better. If you add a little bit of sand to clay soil, you end up developing something resembling concrete. And as a plant, I don't think that would work real well. So don't think that just because I have a small place, I'll add a little bit of sand. Because the other thing is if you have a really large area, you really need to adjust for the entire area. Some people, you know, have come to me, hey, I have heavy clay soils. What do I do? I want to plant trees. And the first thing I'll, you know, I'll tell people with any plant they choose to put in their garden, right plant, right place. If you have poor quality soils, let's try to find plants that are more suitable to those soil conditions. If you have somewhat heavy clay soils and you're trying to plant trees, one of the other options you can do is plant the tree a few inches higher than you normally would. So that flare that we want at ground line, what we can do is actually elevate the plant and it'll help with drainage, you know, elevate it maybe two, maybe three inches up, plant it a little bit higher, it helps alleviate some of those drainage issues and away from the root system. So that is an option if you have some heavy clay soils. Fertilizers. Foliar fertilizer sprays are more effective than fertilizer applied to soil. Sounds good in theory, but it doesn't work. Foliar fertilizers are not going to go from the leaves and then incorporate down into the rest of the plant. What's absorbed in foliar fertilizers are micro, uh, micronutrients, our big nutrients, NPK, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus are not absorbed as a foliar fertilizer. The other thing to remember is that with soils, um, soils have a pH. And that pH, how acidic or base that soil is, dictates the availability of nutrients to the plant. So there could be plenty of a certain nutrient available, but if the pH is on the wrong side of the scale, it is chemically locked in the soil and the plant can't access it. So we could add as much of it as we wanted to the soil, but if the pH is off, it's not going to matter. Now what we can do with foliar fertilizers is kind of use them as a micronutrient deficiency test. So if we know a plant is usually susceptible to a certain micro deficiency or micronutrient deficiency, we can do a foliar spray, see if the plant reacts. If the plant reacts positively, we've probably got a good idea that we have a nutrient deficiency issue and then we can go from there for addressing it. But Foliar fertilizers, again, it's a way to test. It's a temporary fix because most of those new micronutrient deficiencies, you know, th there's something else going on that might be causing them. So don't rely on foliar fertilizers to fix all your problems. Epsom salts. Um, I have a bag of Epsom salts sitting in my own bathroom because I use them to soak my dog's paws who end up having problems. And I was sitting there one day looking at the bag and it talks about how Epsom salts are great for providing magnesium to plants. They assist with insect control. And I went, well, how accurate is that? Is that true? Because I have insect problems. You know, I have plants that probably need magnesium. Will it work? And the idea that Epsom salts is kind of a cure-all for magnesium deficiencies and insect control is sadly not true. Um, magnesium deficiencies only happen in certain soil types um, and, are pot and, and usually are not going to be an issue for us. They're usually available in adequate supply. Um, and I'll always recommend before you start tossing down a bunch of fertilizer, make sure to get a soil test. Know what your pH is. Know what your nutrient availabilities are. And on the other side of things, we don't have enough research to show that Epsom salts actually have effect on plant pests. So it's one of those things that are we adding things that we really don't need to our soil to try to alleviate an issue that may not be there, or it's an issue that maybe there are better methods to address. So don't just start throwing the Epsom salts because you think you need magnesium. Get a soil test first, see where your soil stands, and then you can address it from there. And then this one is the concept of balanced fertilizers. So you go to the store and you're looking through all of them and it talks about balanced fertilizers. It says 10, 10, 10, 20, 20, 20. 
you know, 12, 12, 12, the numbers are even across the board. Nitro, you know, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Here, apply it. This is great for your plants. You should always choose a balanced fertilizer. And is that true? And this one is definitely a myth. Again, this goes to soil test first. Um, part of my job, I get soil test results from um, our local Farm Bureau after they've gotten processed, and I kind of review them, and I look through them, and I look at the pH, and I look at the potassium and the phosphorus levels, and kind of help try to provide some additional insight for if somebody's having a problem and help evaluate that soil test. Um, that test is going to help determine what we need. If there's already a thousand, you know, pounds per, you know, X amount of space, do we need to add more? Because more is not better. Um, and what ends up happening is excessive application of nutrients or unneeded nutrients that are not going to be used by the plants can end up leaching off into groundwater and local waterways. And so if we're, you know, looking at the environment, we want to make sure to minimize any of that kind of damage. So soil test first. Don't always assume that you need a balanced fertilizer. Um, you know, it's especially for gardens in the ground, we really want to evaluate, especially if you're doing vegetable gardening. This becomes really important because if you think about it, you put those vegetables in the ground, they're producing product that we're then taking off and taking away, so there's not a rejuvenation of nutrient availability through, you know, plant decay and decomposition back into the ground. So having a soil test on, on veggie gardens, you know, every few years isn't a bad thing to see where our soil levels are at you know in regards to nutrients to kind of help alleviate issues so always think about it first and before you kind of jump um, towards making those choices and with that myth this is my contact information um, I'm in Adams Brown Hancock, Pike, uh, Pike and Schuyler counties. I'm in West Central Illinois. This is my office address along with our phone number, and there's my email address there. And um, you are always more than free to give me a phone call or shoot me an email, ask questions. I'm more than happy to answer. Um, also, uh, we have all of our past recordings of the Four Seasons Garden Series up on our University of Illinois Extension Horticulture YouTube channel. The website's right there. Um, please feel free to visit. We have all of last year's and we upload, um, we've been uploading this year's usually about the week, about a week after, a few days after the Thursday session. So you can always go back up and review, re-listen, um, and, and kind of catch the ones maybe you've missed. And also, I have a bi-weekly blog post, um, and these are weekly postings along with a colleague of mine, Mike Rogie. We have a blog called Good Growing that I'm always going to encourage you to go see what we have new and posted um, up there for you to read and kind of learn more about. And with that, I will open up... Um, the evening to questions, please feel free to post them in the chat box, or if you're calling in on a phone line, the ability to unmute your phone is star six. A uh, question came up, will, will help lilacs last longer in vases? Um, you know, I ran into that problem, too. Uh, the big problem I ran into is they decided to soak up a lot of water very, very quickly. And um, I didn't have any uh, floral preservatives in the water. Um, probably, I'd say, you know, bigger vases, making sure that as soon as you cut them, put them directly into water if you've cut them and taken them inside recut um, and maybe you know trying a if you're starting to see some issues try cutting them again um, but again indoors it's a lot drier it's going to be a lot warmer and so a lot of those are going to decline a little bit faster than they would outdoors in the cooler temperature so there's a little bit of a limitation I think we're going to see there with you know having lilacs last longer indoors
question is, um, I have a boxwood um, bush that is mostly brown with a little green at the bottom. Shall I keep it? Um, at that point, knowing how boxwood function and, and knowing what could be going possibly on, um, boxwoods are also very shallow rooted, so they also can suffer from some winter burn issues. Um, what I would recommend, if that much of the bush is gone, your best bet is to ditch what you've got and try to start over. Boxwoods are also susceptible to winter burn is issues, desiccation. What ends up happening is they lose moisture and they're not able to replace it because the ground's frozen. And what we end up seeing is we see that damage kind of show up after, sometimes after the winter's kind of done and we start getting into warmer conditions. So if very little of the plants left, your best bet is just to start over. Okay, bunch of, a bunch of questions coming in all at once. Okay, just ha bear with me, folks. Hang on. One of the participants is growing shag bark hickory trees that started from nut. They're six inches deep pot. They will transplant in the fall. Should they move them to the larger pot this summer before transplanting? Um, I think with that, it's going to just depend on how big they are, if they're already having issues with circling roots. Um, or what you could do is if you think they can last, just make sure to address any of those circling, girdling root issues before they go into the ground, prune, cut, move out. But yeah, there's a couple of variables and without seeing just how big and what the root conditions are, it's kind of hard to say whether or not potting up um, and moving up for fall planting would be beneficial. Um, do tea bags do anything for the garden? Um, I've not heard of any benefits for tea bags in the garden, and I'm and I'm not sure kind of what the context is in regards to that. Um, you know, again, you know, you hear a lot of different things saying do this, do that, and again, you know, as an extension educator, I always end up resorting to the research-based information that we have. Um, but tea bags, that's not one of the things I've heard of. Um, is a statement about watering midday true for grass as well? I've had the neighbors long guys scold me for watering lawn at midday. Um, as with any plant, you know, again, it goes back to if watering in the middle of the day was an issue for plants, we'd have a lot of scorched plants when we had summer rains. Um, you know, a lot of it comes down to watering. We want to make sure that the leaf surface has enough time to dry off before those those nighttime temperatures come in because turf that doesn't dry off is a little bit more susceptible to disease issues but it, again it's one of those things that summer rains happen you know at night during the day during the morning afternoon evening and if it was really an issue we'd have a lot more plant issues so I wouldn't necessarily worry about it um, I have anthills all through my yard I read that using cornmeal helps to alleviate these anthills um, you know, I'll be the first to tell you, I, I will sometimes get questions and I won't have an answer. And that's one that I have not, ha I, I have not heard of um, in regards to ants. I've seen your question, Nancy. If you want, um, go ahead and shoot me an email, Nancy, and we can kind of see if we can find out a better, some kind of solution that might help you address some of those issues and what might be going on. Um, and we can go from there. But yeah, that's not something I've heard of. Um, but again, there's so much out there. Uh, marigolds have an effect on keeping mammals away. Again, uh, with a lot of these things, the, the benefits that marigolds seem to provide, um, you know, some people will say, yeah, I put marigolds out there. And then people say, well, yeah, after a while, they, you know, things just kind of got used to it. Um, again, no scientific research showing that marigolds have a beneficial effect on keeping mammals out of the garden. Uh, coffee grounds directly. I'd rather add coffee grounds, um, you know, just straight up coffee grounds into my compost pile and let them compost down than add them directly into the soil. Um, with a lot of materials that aren't composted down, what ends up happening is adding uncomposted material to plant sites. As that material breaks down, um, it actually does hold up and starts using some of the nitrogen. So what I always recommend is make sure that whatever is going in the garden is fully composted first. Um, should you trim off um, asparagus when it goes to seed? Hopefully with most of asparagus you really are hopefully having varieties that aren't going to seed. Um, and I'm trying to remember because it's been a bit since I've dealt with asparagus of, of cutting those off, but a lot of times, you know, with that um, asparagus going to seed, you know, it, it can cause some issues. Some people will do so. Um, Honestly, I, you know, I try to, you try to find male varieties so that you're not having to deal with asparagus going to seed. 
and then how often should you repot spider plants? Um, I've been bad. I don't repot them probably as often as I should. Um, a lot of times with house plants, I kind of look at how is the the growth and the quality. If they're starting to seem, if they're starting to struggle, if they're starting to seem super pot bound. I mean, granted, some plants do prefer to be pot bound, um, and I'll plant them. You know, repot them, and and part of it just depends on growth where you have them. And so sometimes people will replant spider plants every few years um sometimes you know if you're like me you've got a spider plant and you've left it in the pot for probably too many years um and it probably could do a, a do with a good repotting but um sometimes you know it just kind of depends on how well they're they're growing Um, one of the questions is, I have trouble growing poppies and nasturtiums. Any hints? Trying both in containers. Nasturtiums have leaves but not blooms. Sometimes what I've run into with nasturtiums is I get a lot of leafy growth. Um, maybe it's too high nitrogen. Sometimes it's just a timing issue in regards to getting them um, started. And so timing can be of an issue. Um, and so maybe adding in... I'm trying to think maybe even adding in compost, part of it's going to be, you know, where are they planted? Are they gaining enough sunlight? Are they gaining the nutrients and the conditions they need um, to, in, in regards to growth? But yeah, I've had similar problems with nasturtiums, and a lot of times when we have blooms and not growth, um, sometimes that can be, you know, a lot of nitrogen and just not a lot of other, you know, uh, fertilizer, or I should say uh, nutrient availability that we need. And then Sherry's asking about um, poppies. You know, I've had, I've not had, you know, great luck with poppies. Um, sometimes they end up just kind of fading out on me. They don't do quite as well um, in the garden. And a lot of times, you know, they can be a little bit sensitive, um, depending on, you know, if you're talking, um, you know, some of our, our annuals, you know, annuals or perennial poppies, you know, which ones are you looking at? So, um, Sherry, if, if you want, go ahead and shoot me an email and let's see if we can kind of work through some of the other potential issues that might have um, issues. Poppies, usually I don't grow in, in containers. I'll grow those in the ground directly. Can, uh, if you have asparagus in a plot by itself, can you use rock salt to kill the weeds from growing? I would not recommend using any kind of salt in an asparagus patch. There's just too much risk of causing salt damage to the roots and causing decline in soil structure. So that is not something I would recommend. Um, would Clorox wipes work to clean metal equipment? I wouldn't see any reason why they wouldn't. Okay, if it is bleach based, okay, that's, I wasn't even thinking about Clorox being bleach based. If it's got bleach at all into it, I wouldn't, I'd look for straight up antibacterial or, um, you know, antiseptic uh, wipes is going to be your best bet. Yeah, so if you can find wipes that have those antiseptic or antibacterial properties, as long as there's no bleach within them, go ahead and use those. I would think they would work. Again, once you use any of that stuff, just make sure to wipe it off, you know, make sure to rinse it off really well with water because you don't want to cause, you know, any kind, you know, damage, especially if there's a lot of residue. Um, just make sure to wash it off really well. And I will go ahead and stay on for about another five minutes or so. So if there's a couple of other questions that come through, please feel free to, you know, unmute your phone or post them in the chat box.